Operation Barbarossa Operation Barbarossa was the code name for the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany and some of its Axis allies. During World War II. It started on June 22, 1941. It was the largest military invasion in human history, with more than 3 million men attacking along an 1800-mile front. The code name was a tribute to Frederick I. A German king and Holy Roman Emperor who had led a crusade to the East in the 12th century. Welcome to the Operation Barbarossa seminar on October 21st. This is a 21st century look at June 22nd, 1941. Rob Kurishabel, who is the author of Operation Barbarossa, talk about wargaming and German planning. Rob Kirschabel is a retired U.S. Army officer, a lieutenant colonel, who served in the armor branch in his service in the U.S. Army. He has a history Ph.D. from Purdue University. His dissertation is centered on military engagement with civil government in Germany from 1916 to 1938. He's written numerous books and articles on military history, concentrating on World War II, in particular the German military and the Nazi-Soviet War. He has taught history courses on the world wars, American military policy, and strategy. He currently lives in Tampa, and today he will be talking about Operation Beowulf, an amphibious assault on the Baltic Islands. Rob, take it away. A little bit of a tangent here. I'm, uh, I'm unloading some war games that I have because I can't find any opponents here in Tampa. And it just so happened, I was looking at him today. I have a John Prados game in there, it's called the Campaigns of Robert E. Lee. So uh, it's a clash of arms game. I see Steve is in the audience out there. So I um, thought you might find that interesting. Um, so real quick, uh, again, support your local artist. For those of you following along in our Operation Barbarossa, this Operation uh, Beowulf is uh, around page uh, 242. Uh, those of you, uh, the A students in the class who have this baby are uh, using map number seven today. And I would just remind people, if, if you're not me and you're not asking a question right now, please mute your microphone. <clears throat> so I generally don't uh, talk about tactical small unit actions like this. I'm more of an operational level guy, but this is a very interesting the study, it's a German amphibious operation, really the, the only one, the largest one uh, that they conducted World War II on the islands in the Baltic off the Estonian coast. So that's what we'll be talking about today. <clears throat> so during World War II, the Wehrmacht conducted very few amphibious operations for two main reasons, lack of desire and a lack of capacity. The Germans' most successful overwater invasion in April of 1940 against Norway, warships and merchantmen ferried troops into established ports. So they just pulled up at a dock in Trondheim or Oslo or whatever and, and unloaded. So not really amphibious. Their largest planned amphibious operation, of course, Operation Sea Lion against Great Britain, was a completely improvised affair, chiefly using Rhine River type barges. And knowing what we know today about the complexities of uh, Operation Neptune four summers later, we can easily speculate that Sea Lion would have been a spectacular disaster for the, the Germans. There's no way it could have won. And uh, so anyway, quite simply, the interwar Wehrmacht put almost no effort into amphibious doctrine, equipment, training, and so forth. The Wehrmacht's one successful foray into this tactic was Operation Beowulf. Uh, and I'm going to be using the, the German names for these islands. These islands, uh, have, we have some name confusion, but I'm going to be using the German names for them. And this was a fully combined and joint assault in the way we understand those terms today. And the Germans considered it the equivalent to, quote, a very wide river crossing. And this is something that both the Army and the Luftwaffe did have a doctrine training and experience to carry out. Now, by Germans, when we talk uh, historically, 
we mean uh, the Teutonic Knights and the Hanseatic League. Um, they had long considered the Baltic their sea. Although, of course, Sweden, Russia, Poland at times were certainly competing powers in the Baltic, and hence the name confusion. So these islands and their cities have a, a German name, an indigenous Estonian name, a Swedish name, sometimes a Russian name. And um, that just adds the uh, sort of the confusion. So I'm going to share my screen now. course not there for some reason let me highlight it here let me go back to this um, sorry about that um let me uh let me close some of these windows in here. That might be part of the problem. Sorry about that. This is crazy. It's not showing. Of course. Okay, here we go. There it is. Share. Wide show. All right. Okay, everybody, you know, give or somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see that, okay? All right, all right. <clears throat> okay. So uh, this is a, a German map. For those of you who don't know this site, germandocumentsinrussia.org, watermark here. Uh, this is an excellent site. We've talked about this before where the, the Russians these days are doing a much better job of digitizing and putting World War II records online than uh, the United States is. But this is a map It's called the, uh, you know, the war at sea situation up until the 27th of August. And here are the islands that we're talking about here. And the Germans have highlighted them. And you see all kinds of red arrows coming out of here. There are a few blue arrows where the, the Germans are kind of hugging the coast or the Finns are working out of uh, their coast or whatever. But the way the Germans portray these islands up here, and it's kind of comical in one regard, is uh, they, they call it an aircraft carrier from which Stalin can just uh, cause all kinds of mayhem in the Baltic. You can see they're attacking all over the, uh, the coast of the Baltic countries. And, and even this, these are airplanes going down to you know, bomb Berlin. And for a country with almost no navy and zero aircraft carriers, the Germans imagine aircraft carriers everywhere. In 1938, they called Czechoslovakia an aircraft carrier, you know, pointed at the heart of Germany. Uh, in 1941, they call the British in Greece an aircraft carrier threatening the Ploesti oil fields. They, they call the Crimean base of the Soviets, the same thing. It's a it's an aircraft carrier that can uh, threaten Romanian oil fields. And here, it's an aircraft carrier that threatens Berlin, never mind the fact that um, the Soviets have uh, no strategic bombing capacity to speak of. <clears throat> it's also worth noting that the Germany's largest World War I amphibious operation, Operation Albion, was also against these islands, took place in October 
1917. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute with regard to the naval feints and, uh, and operations. So this is kind of the big picture here. Here are these islands. These are the two big ones, Ozil and Dago. Uh, that's the German names for them again. And uh, you, can, you can kind of see where they are here. They do, they could dominate the, the Baltic if they were better developed. The capital city down here we call Arenburg. Uh, it's just a large fishing village, so you can't put major warships into there. It's not a major port, and there's no airfields really to speak of in here. Uh, but not to say that it couldn't have that. And um, Army Group North, which is uh, you know responsible for the uh, left flank of Barbarossa, capturing Leningrad, linking up with Finland, and so forth, and also securing the Baltic littoral, uh, they began planning to attack these islands in April of 1941. The staff came up with two options. At this time, they're called OCEL-1 and OCEL-2. OCEL-1 being a, basically a hasty assault from Courland and Riga, sort of from the march, and then OCEL-2, which would be a more deliberate attack once the Germans had taken all of Estonia here, uh, then they would attack. They deemed one infantry division that was reinforced would be sufficient. And so the Army Group staff briefed their commander, Field Marshal von Lieb, on 6th of May for this plan. He had only a few questions, and on the 25th, of May, he signed the order for the renamed Beowulf operation. So they still have Beowulf one and two, uh, they've just changed the name. And for the next couple months uh, through June and July, there's gonna be a lot of correspondence going back and forth between the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Um, on the 8th of July, Army Group North uh, decided to go with uh, Beowulf two, the deliberate attack, uh, with the 18th Army in command. Uh, they stressed the need to take the uh, the small island of Moon, this is the little island here, uh, very quickly. And it's only four miles off the mainland. There's a narrow strait here that's four, four and a half miles wide. And therefore, the uh, um, wide river analogy and from then they would uh, capture the, there's a causeway between the two islands we'll talk about later. So for the Navy, um, <clears throat> they had uh, a few tasks here. Um, one would be to ferry heavy equipment across the water. Uh, equipment is too heavy for the assault boats. This includes artillery trucks, horses, bulk ammunition, bulk food, bulk fuel, and so forth. They also have three uh, feints or demonstration maneuvers. One is called the South Wind. Uh, it's mainly the, the six-inch cruisers uh, in the Baltic. You have to remember at this point, Bismarck is sunk. Prince Eugene is bottled up in Brest. Uh, whoops. The... Um, German Navy does not have a whole lot in the Baltic. So they have three of these light cruisers. Uh, Operation West Wind is going to be a torpedo flotilla and a Schnell boat flotilla, we call you know, uh, PT boats. And then Operation North Wind was going to be a Finnish operation. Okay. And all of these are to kind of fake the Soviets into thinking that the invasion is going to be over here on the west side of these islands. This is where Albion in, in 1917 happened. And so they want to give the, uh, the Russians the, or the Soviets the impression that they're going to repeat um, uh, Operation Albion. Okay. Uh, Naval uh, Group Command North, uh, Group and Commando North in Kiel is going to control the Kriegmarine contribution here. Tactical leadership is going to go to this Marine Bells, the Felshaber, 
under um, Rear Admiral Franz Claussen. And so the Kriegsmarine uh, order of battle is these six-inch light cruisers, some destroyers, torpedo boats, minesweepers, these Schnellboote, the fast boats, and, and various smaller craft. Okay, the Luftwaffe contribution here is going to, their missions are going to be to prevent the Red Army Air Force from interfering with the landings, to do reconnaissance, to attack Soviet artillery, support the crossing of the, the causeway, and to interdict any Red Navy attempts to disrupt Beowulf. And so we're going to have perhaps a half dozen BF-109s from the, uh, the Green Greenheart, Grunherz, uh Fighter Squadron, some uh, BF-110s from a horse vessel, and then a couple outfits of uh, JU-88s, one Luftwaffe, uh, Geschwader 77, and then some uh, Navy JU-88s based out of Riga. And you can see here, I, I put a, uh, a distance marker here. As you can see, it's 100 miles from the main Luftwaffe base. And so they can be anywhere on these islands in 20, 20 30 minutes. What, uh, what these stars represent is the preparatory raids that the Luftwaffe launched in the days before the actual crossing is going to happen on the 14th. So on the 13th, they bombed the what would be the landing beaches, uh, the capital city, and some Soviet defenses in the middle of the island. Luftflotte One, or the first air fleet, is the Luftwaffe operate organization that is supporting Army Group North, and their chief of staff, uh, Major General Heinz Helmut von Wulich, he's going to supervise the Luftwaffe effort here. It's called uh, Fliegerführer B. The 42nd Corps is going to have overall uh, operational command of Beowulf, and the uh, unit tasked to do the fighting is the 61st Infantry Division under uh, Lieutenant General Siegfried Hanneke. Uh, he, this division had not been involved in the uh, Sea Lion Order of Battle, but during the summer of 40, the 61st had trained for a cross channel attack, and possibly the reason that the division was chosen for uh, Beowulf. The division had fought very well in Poland, Belgium, France, and early uh, Barbarossa. And you can see the subordinate units. Uh, three infantry regiments, an artillery regiment, a recon uh, battalion, and a, in addition to an anti-tank uh, battalion and pioneers also. And also involved would be one battalion of the neighboring division, a 217th Infantry Division that would attack the, the little island of uh, Worms. <clears throat> it was heavily reinforced the 61st was and so these are the units that came from the 42nd uh, Corps you can see these are uh, Camo here's the uh, field police um, we we're just talking about a post office and then some mainly some engineer troops some recon troops and a flak uh, battalion and then these are the support troops that are directly underneath the 61st. There are a couple of artillery staffs for coordinating this. And then you can see uh, four very large uh, motorized artillery uh, units with guns up to 150 millimeters and 210 millimeters. They're also reinforced with a uh, forward observer battalion um, and then other um, uh, construction engineers, uh, regular combat engineers. Uh, this is the storm boat commando. These are the guys who are going to use the actual little amphibious boats down here. There's two of them shown here. Uh, 904, 906, 905 will also be involved. And then they also have another flak battery down there, uh, also in support. So you can see this is heavily reinforced 
most of this stuff will not ever reach the islands, or if it does, it'll be on the far islands. Uh, these, these guns can range uh, far and wide on the islands without actually being on the islands. Now for the enemy situation, as usual, whoops, the uh, Germans way underestimate the Soviets that they're going to have to face. In fact, the, uh, the Soviets probably outnumber the Germans, which, you know, not not ideal when uh, con conducting an amphibious operation here. Um, there's a Major General Lisiev who's in command. He has a 79th Rifle Regiment here on the on island of Moon where the Germans are first going to land and then the 3rd Independent Rifle Brigade on the big island of Osel. And two battalions will initially guard Dago up here but when the Soviets evacuate Oso, a lot of those guys will end up up here in uh, Dago. Now, one source I read says that the Soviets had not really done a good job of preparing for this uh, defense. Uh, but as I read the German records of it, it shows that they're, uh, at least initially, they did quite a good job. And then I also provided some uh, light data here. You can see this is uh, they had pretty full days, right? It can it can get dark early and and uh, get dark early at the evening too uh, when you're that far north. But they had Germans. Oh, well, actually, both sides had a, a full day of fighting, and the ceiling, at least on the first day, was some overcast. Um, so these uh, planes are going to be uh, flying awful low. Here's just a couple of documents um, for your uh, for your interest. This is the 42nd Corps uh, order to the 61st Division here to do Beowulf number two. The the invasion from the Big Island of Oso to the the next bigger island of Dago. That's going to be called Operation Siegfried. This is the 61st Division order um, for that. Here's the order for the uh, Marine Command C and for Fliegerführer B, the two uh, supporting uh, Navy and Air Force operations. And these are basically, there's no real big uh, shocker in these orders, pretty straightforward uh, operation. So I already uh, mentioned that the Germans treated this assault as a, a crossing a very wide river. And their main instrument here is going to be what they call the Pioneer Storm Boat Leicht. Uh, it's, a, it's a light wooden boat. Uh, this thing, it sticks out the back. We look, think of it as kind of an outboard motor. They call it a power oar because it, it you know steers and powers at the same time. Um, it has a fairly good speed, uh, 30 kilometers per hour, you know, 18, 20 uh, miles per hour um, can can make the round trip between the mainland and um, uh, moon in about uh, an hour and a half, can hold five to six guys, okay, with light equipment. For example, a uh, um, machine gun, light mortar, that kind of stuff. They're also supported by two Navy assets. One is called the Siebel Ferry, which you can see here, it's, it's quite large, can hold up to uh, 100 guys, uh, half a dozen trucks and vehicles. It's, it's fairly slow. So uh, to make a round trip, even across this uh, four mile straight, takes quite a long time. Uh, much of that time is really spent loading and unloading. And then there's another uh, barge thing. You can see the picture here. This is kind of modern looking. You know, we could we could see this on uh, Tarawa or uh, D-Day or whatever. It's, a, it's kind of a purpose-built looking landing craft. Um, it's not as big as the Siebel Ferry, but it is it, it is a good size and can can carry uh, quite a bit and has a ramp. You know, for uh, for landing on the uh, on the coast.
So remember that during some of these other German landings, for example, Crete, the uh, Germans commandeer a lot of uh, fishing boats, coastal vessels, other small civilian craft to augment their own assets. And that would have been the case in Sea Lion as well, really kind of a uh, thrown together kind of um, Mickey Mouse uh, operation. Here's a schematic of one uh, assault company up here, you could say a reinforced rifle company that required about 65 boats. And you can see there's first, second, third platoon. This is the command group up here. Uh, uh, the engineer, pioneer leader, the radio guy, and then artillery fort observers. You know, they're all uh, in that, that first group. And then what I've done over here is highlighted these, in case you didn't know the German tactical symbols, what these various boats carry. And so you can see they, they distributed the heavy machine guns across all platoons. The, the uh, uh, mountain guns, these are small. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, kind of small artillery pieces, uh, mortars. There was a couple boats with heavy mortars. This one over here had the doctor or the medic on it. And then you also see quite a few ammo boats. They're gonna, they're gonna be burning up ammo pretty quick. And then just for uh, your FYI up here, one, you know, what the Allies would con consider their standard landing craft, the Higgins boat, would basically carry 35 men, uh, 40, you know, full platoon in other words. Each one of these boats, five, six guys. And if you had to carry a mountain gun, a uh, 75 millimeter gun, it maybe had the gun and one guy to, to steer the boat. You could not have any people on it with that little uh, lightweight mountain gun. Okay, we're gonna go back up here to the Navy slide real quick. I guess I should have just duplicated the slide, but, um, the, uh, the the main landing and stuff uh, is going to be complicated. Um, these boats, most of them were de designed for rivers or relatively sheltered water, and they're going to be vulnerable to environmental uh, factors. And in, uh, on 11 September, the uh, seas around here were so rough that Beowulf, uh, the command Hendeke and his guys decided to delay the attack until the 14th. The Navy had already begun clearing the Soviet minefields that were uh, in the strait here, you know, uh, underwater uh, mines. But then to fake the Soviets into thinking that the attack was coming from the uh, west or from the seaward side here, the Kriegsmarine started these um Paints and demonstrations to kind of replicate uh, Albion of a, uh, a generation earlier. Sudvin and Westvin, they actually um, faked actual landings. Uh, but the Finnish operation, Nordvind, was meant to uh, look like a raid from the sea. And uh, this is a picture. Here's the light cruiser Köln uh, doing shore bombardment. And this is the flagship of the Finnish Navy, the pride of the Finnish Navy, Ilmarinen. Uh, it's, it's a good sized ship, has 10 inch guns here. And uh, as part of Northwind, it uh, bumbles into a minefield and uh, Hit two Soviet mines, and seven minutes later, it sunk, taking 270 uh, Finnish sailors down with her. So that's not an auspicious start for the for the operation. Now, those of you with no sense of humor, you want to avert your eyes real quick, because um, this is uh, those of you who are fans of the Horowitz brothers. This is a just a little uh, side note here. 
Uh, they made a, a movie in 1930 or short in 36. We're there in the coastal artillery. And of course, mayhem ensues. And you get to hear Mo snarl, you sank the Admiral's flagship. So uh, just a little humor to go along with your Barbarossa today. So the opening moves <clears throat> uh, after the weather delay are going to look like this. There's basically three of them that I want to talk about. One is that the 217th Infantry Division on the 9th of September attacks the uh, island of Worms. It's relatively lightly defended by the Soviets, and they, they generally need one full day and part of two days. And by the 11th, the Soviets have evacuated. Uh, of interest here is the little green arrow. This is a, a, a group of Estonian volunteers. So when the Soviet Union took over the Baltic countries in 1940, a bunch of uh, Estonian men crossed the Gulf of Finland there to Finland, and they began training with the Finns. And so uh, hundreds of guys went over there. Uh, this particular operation started off with 15 volunteers under an Estonian colonel. This colonel had been the uh, Soviet or the uh, Estonian military attaché in Paris when uh, Estonia was taken over by the Soviets. And uh, for this particular operation, they have two German liaison officers and about 50 volunteers were added. So there's between 65 and 70 Estonians who were with the Finns, and as the Germans take over part of Estonia, these guys come into Estonia. They operate behind Soviet lines. Uh, they get into some firefights with um, the Soviets, so they're they're fairly active behind um, the Soviet lines when the fighting is going on here in mainland uh, Estonia. Well, by mid September. Most of Estonia has been taken over by the, um, the Germans. And so now these Erna group is what they're called. Uh, they're going to participate in the little invasion of, of Worms. Another little minor uh, preliminary is going to be the recon battalion of the 61st is going to go down here to this little island. The Germans call it uh, Schildau. The Estonians call it Kesse. And they're going to capture that in uh, a few hours by by 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, they will uh, capture that island, and they're going to turn that into basically an artillery fire base. So they'll take these ferries and uh, put our big artillery pieces on them and move them to this island here. And so basically, they don't have to worry about Soviets, uh, you know, coming in and and uh, messing with the uh, the artillery. Let's see what else we got here. So on the evening of the 13th, uh, 61st Commander Henneke, uh, Corps reps, Luftwaffe, Kriegsmarine reps all meet for one last meeting at the uh, division headquarters and decide that the uh, Operation Beowulf is going to go off the next morning as planned. Um, and at 0400 on the 14th, uh, Infantry Regiment 151 is going to lead the way in three waves. Um, bad news happens because of currents and the darkness. One company doesn't make it. It, it just does a, a giant 360 and, and loops back to the uh, Estonian mainland. Uh, but there were quite stiff winds, so it, it slowed some of these assault boats. Uh, it swamped others. And... Um, by the time the 3rd Battalion is supposed to go across, there's only about 50 out of the 90 boats that are still working. Um, by about mid-afternoon, uh, they had a, a battery of the artillery uh, regiment across, and um, they, had a, they had a good beachhead with its own indirect fire with that battery of artillery. Now, the Soviets sort of uh, disputing this ill-prepared uh, trope are, are causing massive casualties against the, the Germans here. This is very, very costly uh, 
uh, going across the strait. I'll show you some casualty figures later. But the uh, Soviets have light artillery along here. They have anti-aircraft guns that they depress that shoots into the uh, the boats that are coming across. And so the the first wave, the first battalion gets across fairly successfully, but then the Soviets are alerted and the second and third battalions, second and third waves are going to come across and, and had much, much higher casualties. Now I want to talk about what's going on down here. Uh, this is the big island. This is Ozil over here. Uh, and there's a, an artillery battery down here that Brandenburger commandos are going to attack. This is called the Kubasar Peninsula, and there's this uh, Soviet um, uh, coastal ar artillery battery there. So on the uh, same morning of the 14th, 10 gliders carrying the 16th company of uh, Brandenburgers under uh, Captain Ernst Benisch uh, come across for the initial landing, while at the same time, in about 18 civilian-type fishing boats, the mass of the Brandenburgers plus some uh, pioneer detonation, you know, uh, de demolition troops uh, come across. These guys have trouble both with the uh, heavy waters and the Soviet minefields that are um, still in there, despite. German efforts to take them out. There's still mines that are causing trouble. The the guys in the gliders, they uh, they land unnoticed, but they're about 800 meters off of the guns, away from the guns. Okay, and so they're going to have quite a, a, a hike to uh, get to the the the, um, the boat. A lot of these guys that are supposed to come and support them have to abort because of the heavy seas in the minefield. Uh, the German or the Soviets rather become aware of the Brandenburgers in, in around this artillery uh, battery here, and they launch a bunch of uh, counterattacks. The Brandenburgers immediately go into what the Germans call this eagle or uh, hedgehog defense, this 360 defense, but they only have their light weapons. You know, rifles, maybe some uh, light machine guns, and um, they're going to just be encircled. And so what they do is they, as, as a group in this, this little 360 thing, they just start kind of retreating as a group toward the water. Uh, their, their mission to take the uh, coastal artillery battery is a fail, but they want to save themselves, so they, they move toward the the coast in uh, in this big group, and um, they get to the shore. They have some inflatable rubber boats that they um, uh, they try to use to escape. Um, most of the guys get into the uh, you know the regular deep water out here, where most of them are uh, saved by the fishing boats and the other guys. One of these fishing boats happens to uh, drift back towards shore. And these Brandenburgers are captured by the Soviets and uh, executed. So this whole thing is a big failure. It's kind of interesting just to show this uh, uh, Beowulf just sort of included everybody, right? We got Army, Navy, Air Force, and now uh, what, what the Germans are called uh, special forces, even though it, it didn't uh, really accomplish anything. And these guys hung out here for quite a while. And finally, two days later, some of the seaplanes from down there, Riga Way, come and take the last of these guys uh, off the off the island. They held out against the Soviets for uh, 48 hours, basically. So most of uh, IR-151 made it to Moon uh, on the... Uh, in the morning, early afternoon of the 14th, um, by late or early evening, rather, uh, Infantry Regiment 162 is uh, is joining them, and so initially, uh, it's 
the, the beachhead that they have here, it's a little smaller than what the Germans uh, ideally would have had, but it's about four miles across uh, this, um, uh, this bridgehead. Also on the 14th, using, again, commandeered uh, civilian watercraft and some larger German boats, they brought the reconnaissance battalion across over here to a northern port town. And the Soviets were uh, concentrated down here, and they had very, very thin defense up here. And so the recon battalion, this, this dotted line here shows the limit line of the 14th. You can see that the recon battalion was able to uh, make some good progress. And actually, uh, during the night nighttime thing here, the um, bicycle platoon of the recon company had linked up with the 162nd over here. On the 15th, the uh, 61st continued to advance. Uh, across, I said the 15th, right? The 15th, the, the division continues to attack across. Uh, the other uh, battalion, 176, makes it across. And so the whole division basically is uh, on the island now. They basically take over the whole island uh, by the evening of the 15th, except for a little Soviet bridgehead here by the causeway that goes across. Um, that evening, the uh, Luftwaffe flew some recon missions over the big island, uh, which is here, and uh, the Finnish people on these islands are waving white flags and waving and smiling at the Luftwaffe recon guys. So uh, that night, they uh, give the army this uh, recon report that they think this part of the big island is very lightly defended by the Soviets and has a uh, a friendly civilian uh, population there. So the commander of the 151st, who's kind of the commander on the scene, he uh, makes this immediate decision that early the next morning, they're going to storm across the causeway. They're going to both come across the causeway, and then they're also going to send some of these storm boot uh, across uh, as well. And um, one battalion of... Uh, IR-151 attacks at first light on the 16th uh, against the Soviet bridgehead here. And between 10 and 11 o'clock, they are across the um, causeway, uh, half-hearted Soviet uh, demolitions along the causeway uh, were quickly repaired. And by afternoon, the bulk of the 61st was crossing over the causeway. Whoops. So this is a, a report uh, that the Germans made of, uh, of what they captured on the first day. So you can see here uh, 225 POWs, a couple of guns, uh, even a light tank, some trucks. And uh, so they, they took quite a bunch of stuff. The Luftwaffe was very busy. This is a uh, just a little clip from the... Um, after action report, uh, it talks about the Luftwaffe close air support. And you can see here, they drop massive, uh, massive numbers of uh, ordnance, including, uh, you know, one ton bombs uh, against the Soviets, mainly trying to uh, defend their beaches. And this shows the, uh, the performance of the, um, the air forces. So on the first day, 175 uh, German sorties against two losses. The uh, Red Army Air Force had these uh, RATAs, right? The little um, radial engine fighters, open cockpit, common in the Soviet Union at the time. They lost two of those. Um, the number of sorties goes way down each day. On the next day, 102. On the third day, 82 sorties. But you can see quite a, a big um, Luftwaffe contribution to the fighting on the little uh, island of Moon. And this just shows the casualties. Uh, if you remember the 
uh, some of the other talks I've given, I'm, I'm kind of into casualty reporting here. And so you can see here the first day, very heavy casualties and very heavy casualties also among the storm boat, you know, helmsmen, uh, you know, whatever you call them, these, these pioneer engineer troops who are um, uh, using these boats, right, um, driving the boats. And the way to read these numbers is the, uh, the blue is killed, red is wounded, black is the total. So you can see uh, quite, a, quite a number of uh, casualties, but they go down each day. So the first day, a lot of activity, a lot of vulnerability crossing the water, really no surprise there. Each day the casualties go down and it's kind of surprisingly, uh, only 42 casualties, all of them killed on the 16th. Uh, here's some pictures, uh, the artillery regiment crossing the causeway. You can see uh, what the causeway looks like here. It's got telephone or telegraph wires going alongside. It's basically a uh, uh, two-lane road. Here's Admiral Claussen. He's the commander of the naval effort here. This guy over here is the commander of uh, IR-151. And then um, uh, Major General uh, Vula, uh, the Luftwaffe um, liaison commander, he uh, he flies over there every morning to uh, coordinate with uh, the army commanders on the ground. And this, you know, as usual, um, sort of the Wolfram von Richthofen model of upfront leadership, uh, even a you know a major general landing uh, among the German troops to. Uh, get the, you know, the eyes on the eyes on the ground. Uh, look at, you know, the day's upcoming uh, operations. So this is the fight across the big island here, the uh, uh, island of Ursel, and um, these two red stars kind of represent the main Soviet uh, defensive concentrations. You can see there's more artillery batteries. Shore coastal artillery kind of all over the place, but this just shows the, uh, the the limit lines for each day as the Germans marched across the division, sort of with the infantry regiments abreast and the recon battalion kind of screening the north. The Luftwaffe established a small forward base for the BF 109s. It would later be supplied by the ME-321 Gigant uh, uh, planes, the large supply planes. Um, by the 18th, um, they had captured the uh, shore batteries down here uh, against some uh, Soviet Marines. They took 400 Soviet Marines um, prisoner. But these, these shore batteries here were keeping the German fleet from using the port city down here, the, the, the capital city. Uh, turns out that the northern lights were very bright these days. And so basically they turn uh, night into day and uh, allow the, the two sides to uh, fight pretty much 24 hours. Um, and uh, after a, a tough battle, the uh, capital city falls on the 21st. And um, the, the lines are going to kind of uh, stabilize around here. This is called the Swarba Peninsula. We'll talk about that on, in, in just a minute separately. But this is very narrow. The Soviets retreat down here. They had put up sort of a spirited defense uh, in the first couple of days that the Germans were on the Big Island. But for most of this fighting across the Big Island, it's just localized little pockets of Soviet defenders. And um, what they're what they want to do is conserve Soviet strength for the fight down here on the Swarba uh, Peninsula. Uh, one little interesting side note: uh, on the fourth of October, Engineer Battalion Six Hundred and Sixty, um, in about seventy-five of these assault boats, crosses from uh, Arensburg down to 
Abruka Island, which had a shore battery, another artillery that the Soviets were using to fire onto the mainland here. And by uh, 9.30 in the morning that morning, they had captured uh, the island. Now, uh, important to note is that uh, on the 18th, the bulk of the Luftwaffe elements left the Beowulf fight. Okay, the, the Germans were across or on the big island. They assumed things are going to go their way. So the bulk of the uh, uh, KG-77 and ZG-26, the JU-88s and the BF-110s, those guys around the 18th, most of them leave to go toward the Leningrad front where first Army Group North's main show is in September. Uh, and the, what's left really are just the, the, the couple – uh, BF-109 fighters and the Kriegsmarine aircraft that are down around Riga. That's that's all that remains uh, for uh, Luftwaffe or air support for the troops. So this Swerba Peninsula uh, defense, this is going to be a very uh, tough nut to crack out of the 25 or so thousand uh, Soviet original defenders, about 15,000 of them. In other words, you know, two thirds of them have made it to this peninsula. And you can see it's very narrow. This is only in some places, only a couple miles across. And so very easy to, um, to block off. Um, IR Infantry Regiment 162 starts uh, on the 23rd. Um, actually the 24th, by the 27th, it is, it is so beat up, and it, we'll show you some casualty figures later, that the 151st passes through it and takes over the fight. And it's, it's, it, this narrow bit of the peninsula here is especially uh, tough fighting by the Soviet defenders. Um, the light cruisers uh, Leipzig and Emden come back uh, and, and pour a bunch of six-inch shells into the defenders, especially uh, used against artillery, which is down here on the southern tip. So the Germans had wanted to keep their ships away from here. You know, the Soviets have air aircraft on here, uh, ships and planes. We know what happens uh, in that in World War II. So the German fleet mainly stays off uh, far away from the fighting here, but this fighting is so severe uh, that these two cruisers come back and um, and help the uh, the soldiers on the ground. Uh, on 2 October, finally, these uh, German soldiers get a breakthrough with the Navy uh, JU-88s uh, overhead flying uh, dive bombing missions. Um, and uh, finally, on the 2nd and 3rd, they put the, the main... Um, part of this defensive line behind them to where the uh, peninsula opens up. And at this point, it's three or four miles uh, wide. And um, it's, it's just easier to maneuver around there. So the um, you can see here the Luftwaffe contributes a lot of sorties just in this tiny little bit of land, you know, 10 miles uh, long and three or four miles across. Um, the Germans are going to capture about 3,700, um, uh, 4,000 POWs. They're going to find all kinds of bunkers, clear lots of mines, and about 1,500 Soviets are going to try and evacuate off the island starting on the, the 4th and 5th. Um, uh, some of their equipment also will escape. The Luftwaffe is flying overhead and um, claims credit for sinking a lot of the uh, the ships, the Soviet ships. This uh, is a casualty thing again uh, that I showed you. You can see at some days there's very high casualties, uh, near 100, over 100. Um, some days, you know, noticeably fewer. Here's the, here the same information sort of graphed over here. 
when we go to Swarba uh, Peninsula, you can see lots and lots of casualties. This is very, very deadly, uh, deadly territory around here, especially in this, this narrow bit right here. Lots and lots of casualties every day. And uh, here I have um, uh, graphed it for you. Here, here are the Luftwaffe claims of uh, how many uh, boats that the Luftwaffe or the, the Navy for that matter um, sunk uh, as part of the, the fight for uh, Oso. This is the, the big island, Moon and Oso. This is the, the main part of the um, uh, Operation Beowulf. And then here's uh, uh, casualties for the entire period. Uh, here's the Moon Island fight, the bulk, the mainland Oso. Uh, fight and then the Swarba Peninsula fight, and you can see uh, this was painful, of course, the first day, high casualties. But um, you know, uh, fighting just across the bulk of the island, not all that bad. Uh, really spikes toward the end. Uh, this is the same information um, portrayed in a, a pie pie graph form. Here's a uh, casualty accounting for uh, the Moon and Osel fights. This does not include Operation Siegfried against the, the last island of Dago, right? And you can see these are the three infantry regiments here. You can see they clearly, especially 151 and 162, they take a bulk of the uh, casualties. This is the... Uh, Artillery uh, regiment here. They took quite a, quite a few casualties. Here are the three. These are the support troops. Here are the three um, stormboat commandos, the assault boat things. And you can see they have uh, about 100 casualties ultimately between them. And then here's Group Benish. These are the Brandenburgers who attacked um the coastal uh, battery, and you can see they had quite ca quite a high number of casualties, uh, mainly among their enlisted men. They lost 22 guys in that 48-hour uh, uh, fight. So this just shows the uh, this is the division uh, casualties strictly, and you can see, of course, uh, 151 and 162 took the most of the casualties. Uh, this is the all the uh, the other units. Uh, the flak, the two uh, flak companies that they had took a lot of um, casualties. Pioneer Battalion, these are, these are uh, the different boat uh, outfits here. So you can see they are pretty bad. And then here's the, the Brandenburger casualties. And this is just to show you where the um, casualties, were, how they're distributed. Of course, uh, light gray, these are platoon leaders. So these are your, your lieutenants. They are very high casualties. Almost half of all officer casualties are platoon leaders. Not a big surprise there. Over a quarter of them are company commanders. And as, as we've seen in other studies of um, German casualty, officer casualties, medical staff takes an inordinate um High high percentage of of uh, of casualties. So you can see in total, the um, 61st Division suffered 49 officer casualties. Uh, this little 217th, just for their little two day operation against the island of Worms, had uh, four, and the various uh, army troops, the artillery, pioneers, flak, whatever. They lost um, 12 officers. You can see 65 total officer casualties during um, OSO. So this is uh, part two of the operation. This is called Operation Siegfried, the attack of the uh, island of Dago, the, the second large island here. This, this is a map of the the naval uh, operations, 
again, the, uh, the German Navy is going to come out here, uh, presumably some Finnish ships as well, and um, make all kinds of feints and demonstrations around the coast of the island. This is where the actual uh, attacks are going to happen here. Uh, here's the, uh, the Erna group, the uh, Finns and Estonians. But the main, the main German attack is going to happen down around here. Remember, um, Storm Buta, these things can't go far. So this is what the Storm Boots are going to go here. And then the larger ships, the ferries and the barges are going to uh, go here. But again, the uh, feints and, and the demonstrations conducted by the German Navy are fairly successful in faking out the Soviets where the landing is going to be. The Luftwaffe also launches numerous um, attacks on the uh, uh, Dago um, in the days leading up to uh, the, the actual attack. So the fighting on Osel stopped on the 5th of October. One week later, uh, the Germans are back. Uh, again, they, they land two infantry battalions down here and the recon battalion on the west side. Um, the weather uh, has turned kind of cold and rainy. Um, um, the, the minesweepers and, and other coast uh, ships are taking the recon battalion over here, and by mid-afternoon, the um, uh, Germans have basically secured the southern tip of the uh, island. On the on the next day, um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, pretty soon the entire 61st Division is across. Uh, remember, these are highly attrited. Uh, units, a lot of a lot of casualties, a lot of licking of wounds that are going on here, and they're going to slowly attack northward against kind of uh, spotty, again localized uh, Soviet resistance. They the Soviets are not really going to um, put a big defensive effort here until up here. This is called the Takuna Peninsula. This thing around here again. This is where the Soviets decide to. Make their stand, but they're going to. The Germans got to fight slowly, uh, doggedly up the uh, island against Soviet defenders and uh, snow. These guys, as usual, not dressed uh, for the snow. We can also see over here on the east the uh, uh, Finnish trained Estonian volunteers uh, have come here from uh, Moon, and so the Germans make a slow and steady advance up here, and uh, finally on the 21st, the uh, Soviets are going, uh, going to um, uh, end resistance. The Germans are going to capture about 3,400 POWs here, and they estimate that about um, 570 Soviet um, uh, are going to escape across, you know, to, to fight another day. Uh, just a couple more slides, just almost done here. This, this discusses the uh, logistic effort that the, the Germans uh, did to, to support this operation. And you could say this is um, uh, man, horses, um, Heavy weapons, trucks, cars, motorcycles, uh, bicycles, uh, stuff that they bought across. There's more information down here. Um, by this is in, in very narrow time frame. So this is, um, let's see, what day? I thought this, I thought it said what day. But anyway, so in one day, uh, from 10 to 2, in other words, four hours, they brought this much stuff across. So they are, they're hustling uh, stuff across. And uh, another 
a document said that this is the uh, supplies that they brought across over from the mainland to these islands, this much ammunition, food, fodder for the horses, and fuel. And uh, two of these ME-321s also flew in, brought in 24 tons of equipment. This GW here refers to Gefechtswagen, a you know, battle wagon, and that's what this is here. This is a German purpose-built um, wagon. We hear a lot about Panji wagons in uh, the Soviet um, Russia. The Germans also had their own, you know, modern, this is a modern weapon, rubber tires and stuff, but still pulled by horses. So you can see they had quite a few of these. These wagons are very common way to um, bring bring supplies uh, all over the battlefield. And then um, last slide here, a couple of interesting documents I found. This one from the 16th of October uh, is telling the um, assault boat uh, guys, 904, 5, and 6, to be ready to uh, go toward uh, Leningrad in the case that Kronstadt the uh, the large, uh, huge, really Soviet naval base island, you know, right off the coast of Leningrad and the surrounding uh, Finnish islands needs to be taken. So, you know, the Germans are thinking of, of uh, taking Kronstadt. And then uh, a couple of days later, here's a congratulatory message signed by Field Marshal von Brauchich to the men of the uh, 61st Division congratulating them on their hard-won fight uh, against these islands. So to conclude uh, real quick, um, the bottom line here is that, you know, this is really the, the only German amphibious operation of the war. It goes relatively okay. Um, but you can see where it wouldn't work again unless you're crossing a three or four mile straight against minimal resistance. This is just, it's not, you can't do this again in this fashion with these little tiny, basically, a, you know, the water ski boat you would take out on a weekend to get across uh, is just not going to work. Uh, the German AAR uh, gives the Soviets credit for. A uh, well-equipped uh, army, lots of uh, lots of equipment. They pulled some uh, surprises, some razzle dazzle maneuvers. But the Germans give the Soviets low marks for uh, weak command and control, and just not having a a, a real mindset of counterattacking. So the uh, the 61st is just going to make slow and steady uh, advance across the island. They're going to uh, suffer about 2,800 casualties. Uh, but for the next three years, these uh, Baltic islands are really kind of a sleepy backwater. The, the Germans really don't do anything with them uh, during the war. Uh, as part of the general withdrawal of Army Group North during 1944, the OKW decides to uh, conduct a fighting withdrawal from the island. So uh, parts of three German divisions which were defending it are going to just uh, slowly fight backwards against two Red Army uh, rifle corps, a battle that takes basically two months in 1944 from 29 September to 23 November. Uh, most Germans were evacuated successfully, but the Germans really never put any lessons learned from Beowulf to much use because they would not uh, ever conduct a similar operation uh, during the war. So here end of the lesson, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. All right. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, we've been talking and listening to Rob Kirschabel, who's the author of Operation Barbarossa, Atlas of the Eastern Front. He's been talking about Operation Beowulf the amphibious assault on the Baltic Islands in 1941. For those of you who are watching this uh, in a podcast mode, 
Uh, the next event will be on Saturday, October 28th at 1 o'clock. We're going to be joined with Professor Jeffrey Roberts, Emeritus Professor of History at the University College of Cork. He'll be talking about Stalin and June 22nd, 1941. But let's get to the questions. Uh, uh, please raise your hands, and uh, we will take people in the order of the comments they make. Let's start with Fred. Fred. Yes, first of all, I'd like to say, say thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, you said that you'd say a few words about the World War I, was it 1917 operation of the islands? Right. Um, well, I, I, I sort of did by, by saying that they landed on the western uh, side. It was actually um, a very big operation, quite a few heavy warships. You know, the German Navy in 1917, they're kind of, they've been uh, taught a lesson by their betters at Jutland and whatever, right? So they're uh, very active in the, um, in the Baltic. And so they sent quite a large detachment of heavy warships to support this operation and uh you know october 1917 the uh, russian war efforts kind of collapsing and it was it was actually a very uh kind of easy operation for them but it's all part of the greater um imperial german efforts in the baltics uh helping finland you know in their uh, uprising against the Russians and and so forth. So, I mean, uh, I don't know much about the actual fighting. I don't think there was a whole lot of fighting. Okay, thank you, Fred. Alex, go on, Alex. Yeah, Rob, again, thanks for a great talk. But um, when you were saying um, that there was no uh, German amphibious operation after this, but th there was, which is um, the operation of the Dodakani is in... Um, Eastern Mediterranean in November 43, after the Italians surrendered, um, you know, the British moved into the islands, you know, like Rhodes, Kos, and La Rosse, and then the the Germans conducted, uh, you know, despite some casualties, um, a pretty successful um, invasion, well, two of the islands of Kos and then La Rosse, where they essentially overran um, uh, the Brits, and, uh, well, they captured 44,000 um, Italian soldiers, but um, eliminate well again, killed and wounded. I think 40, 4,800 um, British um, soldiers. Even yeah, and e that was despite again, you know, considerable effort by um, the Royal Navy, which did sink some landing craft, but um, again wasn't able to prevent um, the overrunning of those islands. Well, so, but it sounds like again you're not aware of um, no, I'm, I'm that or like what be. lessons. They would have applied from Beowulf to, to that later operation. See, they the, because I'm making a distinction between just an overwater attack mm -hmm. and uh -huh. an amphibious attack. See, so mm -hmm. they they did like they did in uh, Norway at Crete. They did the same thing, right? They put a bunch of they got fishing boats and little lighters and little freighters and little stuff and went to a port city. And when they when they went to Rhodes, that's what they did. I'm calling amphibious. You know, landing on a beach, coming out of, you know, landing craft kind of a thing. Uh, so that's my distinction. I, I know that the Germans did other little overwater operations. I just don't call them amphibious. All right. Thank you. Um, please raise your hand if you have any other questions. I have a question for you, Rob. Yeah. What relationship of this operation to the overall thrust of Army Group North at this time? Uh you know, an interesting sideshow. This island group didn't really pose any threat. Uh, I suppose that if the Soviets had held it, uh, they could have, you know, launched raids and stuff in the German rear uh, in that thing, If it, you know, between 41 and 44 when they finally captured it. Um, you know, they it's, it's kind of like Crete in the sense that the Germans take this island and you say, oh, wow, they can do fantastic stuff with this island. You know, this is going to, in the case of Crete, this is going to totally interdict the entire Eastern Med. Well, the problem with Crete is that it's at the end of this disastrous logistical chain through enemy-occupied Yugoslavia, through super-hostile occupied Greece, and then across water. 
to a super primitive island. So it's not like the Americans taking stuff and dropping it on Great Britain, you know, where we can really cause some damage from here. Every gallon of fuel that they take to Crete, you know, it's a labor to get it down there. And, you know, this never really capitalized on it for logistical reasons. And this is kind of the same that uh, they have these islands. But like I said, the Baltic is kind of a German lake for most of the war. The Red Sea or the uh, Red uh, Baltic fleet is tied up in Kronstadt. Submarines come out periodically, maybe small raids with torpedo boats or something like that. There's no massive sortie of whatever the Soviets have left at Kronstadt. And it's mainly just, you know, uh, cargo ships going back and forth from Sweden, uh, stuff going from Germany to Finland, very, very occasionally interdicted, sorry, uh, by the Soviets, either by air or by sea. And so it's it's kind of a dead end. You know, it just remains this backwater that, this, that doesn't do anyone any good, really. Mm. Right, before I bring you on, Craig, uh, Steve Walling has a question. For the German glider assault, was the idea to land directly atop the Soviet guns as at Eben Amal? And that miscarried and landed them some way off. Is that what happened with this operation? The use of the Brandenburger company? Right. And this is not a, a big fort with a big flat roof. You know, these glider guys landed on Ibana Mail. You know, it's highly rehearsed. The, the, the Germans knew that fort was there for 10 years or whatever. Right? And it always been thinking about how do we take it out? These are nothing. This is nothing to like it. I don't even think these guns are probably even um, like Atlantic Wall Normandy, uh, super dug in concrete uh, faced, bomb proof, all, all but the most direct hit, vulnerable um, things. So I don't know. I've not seen pictures of what the actual guns look like. Um, I suspect that the Germans did not want to land right on top of them, but they didn't want to land a half mile away either. Um, they would have preferred to be very close, you know, use the um, element of surprise more and just overpower the gun crews and whatever small garrison they had. All right. Uh, Craig. Yeah. I just want to say, um, Rob, that was just a terrific, uh, uh, presentation. It was uh, terra incognita to me. I, I knew, of course, that the Germans had attacked those islands, but uh, as you say, it was kind of a sideshow, but a pretty fascinating one. And I just have to ask you, um, where did you learn to, to put together some some great uh, uh, great um, uh, slides? Uh, just the the detail and. Uh, it's just amazing to me. I mean, I I pr pride myself on having made it through almost 30 years as an Air Force historian without ever having to even do a um, PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> so uh, you did a you did an amazing uh, job on that, and it was uh, it was it was just just uh, fascinating. So thanks for all your work. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, I think I think you have to learn to embrace the suck. <laughs> you know, they talk about death by PowerPoint, and it's kind of <laughs> what this is. Um, and you know, it's just it's just not it's just not that hard. I, 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 average intelligent guy could teach themselves to do what I did without super mega effort. I don't believe it's uh, you know once you get the hang of it, clip clip art, cut and paste, making arrows. You know, red ones, blue ones, fat ones, thin ones, dashed <laughs> ones, whatever. You know, put a little word, little word things around. You know, it, it makes it so, you know, I, I can just kind of talk from the slide. You know, I do read some stuff that I'd written down, but, I, I you know, I can kind of talk from the slide because it has, you know, I try not to make it too busy, but it, it has a lot of the stuff I need. Yeah, that's, that's a good point to be able to to just talk from the slide and 
And you can do that and kind of uh, uh, do it uh, extemporaneously and spontaneously without having to prepare detailed notes. Yep. You got to move into the 21st century, Craig. Uh, no, I never. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> let me just ask if anybody else has any comments or questions. Uh, Volker, Chauvin, Joe, uh, Hal, Frank, uh, uh, other folks who haven't said anything, Ken, any, any of you all want to add your comments to this? Oh, I see I'm hit with blinded silence here. Uh, sort of stunning in a way, considering all the people here who I know pretty well. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, on that note, if anybody does not have any comments or questions, I want to thank Rob for a really, this was an excellent, I mean, I didn't know anything about this operation. So this was really excellent to learn about it. Ah, Hal, go on, Hal. Oh, Hal's clapping you. Okay. Uh, all the emojis. And uh, thank you so much. It was really enlightening beyond one's wildest dreams. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been talking with uh, Rob Kirschabell, who's a retired U.S. Army officer. His branch was Armor. He has a Ph.D. from Purdue, and he has written a whole bunch of books on military history, including, um, I guess, four or five, well, five or six for Osprey, maybe more, um, including the Atlas of the Blitzkrieg. Is it, that's the title, Atlas of Blitzkrieg Warfare? Uh, what's that? The, Blitz mo the, the, the other Mostly, Atlas? Yeah, the Atlas of the Blitzkrieg era. Yeah. Is that what it's called? No, it's just Atlas of the Blitzkrieg. It, it covers from, uh, you know, Anschluss or Czechoslovakia, at least, through the Yugoslav Operation 25, everything up to um, Barbarossa on mainland Europe. So it doesn't doesn't cover North Africa, but it covers, you know, the U-Boat War, the Battle of Britain, the uh, Bonnemail, Narvik, Poland, the, the Soviet Winter War against Finland, Nomon Han, the Soviets against the Japanese out in Mongolia or Manchuria. Um, first couple of years of U-boat stuff. So it's 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 everything that happened in Europe up until Barbarossa. Ah, I see. Uh, Fred has a question. Go on, Fred. Yeah, I just wanted to say I've got an awful lot of uh, media that would really go well. For example, film footage of also the moon invasions, also from the World War One. Um, no. If you'd like me to put some of the stuff together in in uh, in video format, I, could you send me your PDF or I'm sorry, your PowerPoint, just so I can get clean shots of your screens that you're talking about? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, put your put your email in a uh, in this chat down here. It's, it's easy. Info at Military1945.com. Yeah, I'll make sure you guys get you guys hook up. Um, Frank, go on, Frank. Yeah, actually, I've got a couple of um, interesting questions. Uh, I think first of all, um, looking at the naval conferences around about this time, and the preoccupation of Adolf with. Um, uh, the United States on the one hand, but also uh, the odd situation with Romania. Romania wasn't supplying oil because uh, they refused to to do that without gold from Germany. And so that was interesting. So they're short about 100, and, so it says 116,000 tons of oil, which would impact the Italians just as much. So that's, that's an odd thing. I believe also that there was a, a proposal at some point to put the Turkets in the Baltic as I recall, uh, that was denied. Um, also, the preoccupation with northern Norway uh, and the idea that the Brits were going to take Murmansk somehow or reinforce Murmansk, uh, that was interesting. And the fact that this operation would probably be facilitated by paratroopers, given the success at Crete, um, that was that ever proposed? So um, yeah, the the whole idea that uh, Britain would be uh, interfering with the operations somehow and, 
and taking out Sweden and Finland somehow. Uh, these are odd decision-making. Um, oh, yes, and the other one was the, the Navy. The German Navy was asking for a final definitive um, um, question on the sea line. Sea line was still being, was still out there, and this was strange. So uh, do you want to make any comments about the oddities of the uh, discussions at the at the top, that'd be good. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> uh, oddities and German strategy, I mean, they go together like this, right? I mean, that uh, they, they don't understand strategy like Roosevelt and Churchill and even Stalin do, you know, so there's all kinds of crazy stuff going around there. Uh, you asked a lot of questions. If I was to try and um, remember them. So Turkey, uh, I think Turkey learned its lesson in World War I. Uh, the Germans wooed them throughout the war, at least till mid-43, uh, always trying to get them to, to join in wanting to hold on to Crimea really as a way to show Turkey how strong the Germans were on the Black Sea and that kind of stuff. But um, Turkey's kind of like Franco-Spain. Uh, once they saw a Battle of Britain fail, and once they saw Barbarossa fail, they're going, nope, this ain't happening. I I'm, not, I'm not jumping into this. Uh, it can only go bad. And so I don't know anything serious about Turkey wanting to get involved in the Balkans or anywhere else with the Germans, for that matter. I think they they, they learned their lesson. Um, the Navy and Sea Lion, I mean, Sea Lion is just a joke. If you, if you read about how the Germans were going to do that, take a, a Rhine River barge, lash an 88 to it and push it across the channel. I mean, that's what, that's what they seriously really were going to do. It's just a joke, you know, and when we know about Operation Neptune in June of 44 and all the stuff it needed to uh, plan and, and uh, back, back load, you know, have be ready for that operation and how difficult it was, and, you know, things like the Mulberry Harbors and the Pluto uh, fuel uh, cable or, you know, uh, tube under the channel and uh, Higgins boats and whatever, LCTs, a whole, a, whole, a whole thing. There's absolutely no way the Germans could have been successful doing that. So I don't know what the German Army or the German Navy, rather, which is tatered at this point, right? Bismarck is sunk. Half their stuff is is either broken or bomb damaged or whatever. So uh, I don't know what the Navy's thinking. They're that this whole thing about the, the death ride mentality is just is just crazy. Um, the British causing trouble uh, in the South. I guess you're talking about you know bombing Ploesti, doing whatever. I mean, we know that the uh, when the Winter War is going on, uh, the French and the Brits are thinking about going through Narvik or Sweden, violating Swedish neutrality to get to Finland, right? So they're they're willing to piss off Norway and Sweden, um, can really conduct acts of war against these neutrals that would make them the bad guy, you know, maybe push them into the German arms, Sweden. Sweden and Germany is already this way. They have been since World War I, right? So if the French and British armies come barreling through there to help Finland or whatever, that's only going only gonna to go backwards, you know. Only a kind of a, a, a knucklehead would think of that thing. But, you know, they, the British had plans to go and bomb a Soviet oil facilities on the Caspian Sea and Baku and these different places. And the Soviets knew that. So Stalin knew that these um, 
British and French were they're against him in Finland, right? They're willing to help Finns against him. And they have plans, I think, you capture documents or radio transmissions or whatever, where the, uh, um, the Royal Air Force is thinking, we'll just go and uh, bomb uh, Baku from, you know, occupied Iran or wherever, you know, uh, mandate Iran. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of crazy ideas floating around out there. Um, I, I, I hope I answered your questions. There are kind of too many. I know I've forgotten a couple of them. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. You know, you're raising, uh, Frank is raising Operation Sea Lion. I just got uh, from eBay because uh, I couldn't find my old copy of uh, Wheatley's book on Operation Sea Lion which I wanted to reread uh, and look at, uh, given what we're doing. And the issue of the Middle East, the issue of the Finnish war and how it interrelates to all this is another subject to look at, you know, in greater depth. Um, you know, the winter, the whole lessons they draw from the Winter War, uh, the, the Soviet Army and uh, political and mil military leadership. Uh, Weren't you going to have one of your speakers uh, do the diplomatic angle? He, well, I think we're going to explore that you know the into the period from the uh fall of france to june of 1941 indeed is something to get people to talk about in depth uh i have a feeling that uh, professor roberts and professor kramer are going to concentrate on the uh issue of stalin and the red army and readiness issues as of june 1941 the diplomacy in between is something to get and find people to talk about in a particularly nuanced and uh, subtle way. Of course, uh, being cognizant of the new uh, interpretations and documents that have been released. Uh, I was going to ask if, uh, if, Volker, if Volker, if you wanted to make your comments on anything about Operation Barbarossa at this point or your thoughts about this, we're covering a particularly... Uh, a, a, a part of Army Group North's advance to Leningrad, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts you wanted to share with us on this issue. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jim, <laughs> trying to involve me, but I must confess, first of all, I found this a very illuminating talk, and the only question that occurred to me, you mentioned Kronstadt, of course, Um what is the strategic larger situation? Because after all, Leningrad was uh, supposed to be left out of and uh, besieged. And uh, is there any uh, attempt by the Germans to move, uh, so to speak, northeast uh, towards uh, the towards Kronstadt and, and Leningrad? But uh, otherwise, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, the other talks that you have scheduled, Jim, uh, because I've only recently joined you, and I have no particular comment except, of course, you have already s studied uh, the Barbarossa and uh, the en enormous overestimation of uh, the Germans and their position, strategic position. And it's, of course, well known that it was not just Hitler who was cock a hoop about this being an operation that would take just a few weeks, but his generals were too. And I think uh, there is still this very interesting book by Barry Leach, which mm. uh, many of you will know, which shows just how terribly badly uh, planned this was uh, in June 1941. But that's really where I have to pass. So thank you. Thank you. I was actually looking for Barry Leach. I understand he passed away. Uh, what Volker was referring to was German strategy against Russia that Barry Leach did many years ago uh, that was really an illuminating book for me at the time. And unfortunately, I believe he taught it uh, up at, uh, in Canada. And unfortunately, he's uh, no longer with us. But I would have—I like to have heard what he had to say. Rob, do you, what are your feelings about the general? You know, the kind of questions that Volker Bergen just raised. Um, 
I do not know uh, about more direct plans to actually take Kronstadt. Um, again, it would be it would be a tough tough thing to do. Uh, Luftwaffe pilots who had flown over London for six, eight months, whatever, during the Blitz, and then were flying over Leningrad, they said they would fly over London any day compared to Leningrad. It was just deadly to be in the air over Leningrad. And we can, I mean, Kronstadt, you could, you could see Kronstadt from, from the, the mainland shore. So, I'm sure part of that kind of air defense protective umbrella that covers um, Leningrad also covered um, Kronstadt. And so even if the Germans had a viable airborne capacity after Crete, it would be flying into just a hornet's nest of air defense stuff. I don't believe they would have the... Uh, amphibious or even you know port to port capability to to take that island i understand it's a very heavily defended island you know it's the main base for the soviet baltic fleet and um <clears throat> that'd be, that'd be but i i was wondering rob also how far you know uh, did heroscope and nord uh, actually already decide that they wouldn't uh, attempt uh, further north. They concentrated on Moscow. We we're hoping to achieve a breakthrough there, it seems to me, in the summer of 1941, just a few weeks after they had invaded the Soviet Union. Uh, so when uh, would be interesting, when was the decision done by made by the Germans to, uh, uh, to leave the north uh, so in in a state of uh, siege, um, which after all was disastrous for uh, the city and millions of people died, whereas uh, at the same time, uh, the Germans concentrated on other fronts. Yeah. Well, I think it's right around the time of this Operation Beowulf, to tell you the truth. And uh, the Germans were presented with this uh, inconvenient truth that Leningrad was just too tough a nut to crack. So uh, <clears throat> already we've I've said that they could not count on any fantastic close air support to and they they said I, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago and when I was talking that the Germans could not even take Stalingrad, which is a tiny provincial town of maybe a quarter to a third of a million people, they couldn't take that city. Leningrad has maybe two million, a huge hinterland where the Finns are not, the Finns are not going to come into uh, Leningrad. Um, it has its own industry. It's just, it's just never going to happen. It's just, so they learned that, and so Hitler Hitler does this often. Oh, I never really wanted to go there. Yeah, you know, I just wanted to get close, and then we're going to starve them out. Well, that didn't even work, right, because they had a, a very leaky blockade, mainly Lake Ladoga, that um, the Germans couldn't even block off a lake. It's a very large lake, right, no doubt, but uh, it's... It's a lake, uh, nonetheless. So forget about the Gulf of Finland or the Baltic or something. The Germans couldn't even stop in a whether it was iced over or not. They couldn't stop um, the, uh, the Soviets from getting across that lake with all kinds of, you know, people, food, ammunition, whatever, evacuating wounded evacuating works of art or whatever. So, I mean, the, the Germans, they're, they're not going to take a city of 2 million of Leningrad. They're not going to take a city of 5 million of Moscow. 
and we were talking about this last time because I mentioned the delay of a month or so because of the Balkan operation, the uh, just the rail capacity problem the Germans had, and the um, the weather thing that you know we're getting more and more kind of information about that's trickling in. But even if the Germans had had another month uh, in 1941, they're not going to take cities of two, three, four, five million people. It's just it's not going to happen. Could I jump in for a second here? Go on, Craig. Um, getting back to, to uh, Volker's questions, which uh, Rob is uh, answering answering well there. Um, if I recall, just going from memory here, I think the Germans, uh, with at least their heavy artillery, actually began to bombard Leningrad right around the 3rd of September and, uh, and, and pushed, of course, right into the suburbs uh they had moved a, a lot of uh, hoth's hoth's uh, panzer corps which had been on the left flank of army group center they had sent it um in august and, and sometime in september they had sent it up north to to fight with Lieb's army group but on september 5th hitler issued his order to um to prepare <clears throat> as quickly as possible for the final offensive against Moscow, and most of that armor was then uh, uh, pulled back to the sector of uh, Army Group Center to take part in in um, <clears throat> Operation Typhoon, the actual uh, direct advance toward Moscow. But there are OKW uh, German uh, Armed Forces High Command directive, um, I think uh, that was issued uh, reflecting an, an order that was issued by Hitler I believe around the 4th of, of, of 4th of, sometime in early July 1941 when it looked like the war was going to be over in, in in a matter of weeks but it seemed to be going so successfully but Hitler actually issued orders at that time not to to go into Leningrad to encircle it to starve it out and he also issued orders to do the same thing at Moscow. In fact, Moscow, which I think was even a larger city, I think it had like something like somewhere around 4 million, and Hitler ordered that it was to be apparently raised to the ground and turned into a lake. But <clears throat> a final point, getting at this whole issue of just how, uh, of the element of, of hubris and just how overconfident Hitler and his high command was, I think in a general sense, uh, the, the, the weight of the argument uh, leans in that direction. But they kind of, Hitler and a number of his high command, they kind of went back and forth because they actually knew so little about the Soviet Union. It was a her, essentially a hermetically sealed off state. And there's this very interesting anecdote I, I came across in my research years ago where the chief of the army general staff, um, uh, Franz Halder, goes down to visit with some, in April of 41, just weeks before Barbarossa began, he goes down to talk with um, some uh, high-ranking officers of, of, of German 17th Army, which was a part of uh, Army Group South. And he puts, puts on, a, uh, he has a, on a stiff upper lip, he's very confident in talking to them about the upcoming campaign and the mission of Army Group South and so forth. And there's this one officer who is watching Halder very carefully. And he said, when immediately when Halder walked away and turned his back, and somehow this guy could see, I guess, Halder from the front, he said Halder's lips literally started trembling. Like, like he was saying one thing to the officers of this army, but then walking away, he was he just had these just incredible doubts, which were so strong that, that his, his lips and his fate were actually trembling, which is kind of a, um, kind of an interesting uh, anecdote. Well, I will say this about your, your comments there, Craig. So Soviet Union was hermetically sealed. And uh, from an OPSEC standpoint, that's a good thing. And, the Third Reich should have been hermetically sealed, but it wasn't. But 
Hitler and the top Nazis knew nothing about anywhere in the world, right? Uh, even wide open democracies like U.S. and U.K., he knew nothing about them. No, that's he true. He had true. no idea. He had no idea what he was going up against, what their capacity was. On the 8th of December, 41, he's going to declare war on the United States. That's somehow in his best interest. You know, I mean, he he and his top Nazis, they know Netherlands maybe a little bit, maybe Poland a little bit. That's it. That is as much as they they know they don't understand Spain. They don't understand anything. And so this is how Ribbentrop is is well traveled in Nazi circles because he lived in London for a year or two when he was ambassador, right? So he's he's worldly by Nazi standards because he, he lived somewhere other than Germany for a year or two. So that's how they're they're just blind and and willfully ignorant of stuff and maybe when someone would tell them you don't want to do that their hubris wouldn't allow them to okay you know into into the gestapo prison for you so i mean they're just they are just ignorant of and, stuff and, and, and yet in spite of all their ignorance which you know i certainly agree hitler hitler knew knew nothing essentially about uh uh, about the United States, um, they, they did certainly understand that that the, that they needed to defeat the Soviet Union quickly because I mean you're talking about a population of almost 190 million versus a German population of about 80 million. They understood that if if they failed to to to, to defeat uh, to smash Russia in a matter of weeks. Uh, well, then that would give uh, the Soviet Union time to call up uh, reservists. And, and uh, as, as Dunn has pointed out, I um, can never think of his first name, but he, he written Walter. a lot about it. Oh, pardon? Walter, Walter Walter Dunn. Yeah. He has pointed out that uh, from June to December, the um, Russians committed 50 new armies from the beginning of June to the end of December, 50 new armies to the Eastern Front. And and they may not have been as well equipped or well trained as the German armies, and and they were only in size, maybe roughly equal to a German, a full strength German corps. But I mean, that's a lot. That's millions of of, of new men and forces, and they just uh, attrited the, uh, the the Germans down uh, down to a nub. But uh, yeah, and, and, but the, the amazing thing is, in spite of it all. By the end of December, nineteen, or, or by the beginning of December, in Barbarossa, the Germans had what? They had conquered uh, either either five hundred mile, five hundred thousand miles, or five hundred thousand uh, kilometers of, of territory, um, and that that's um, I, I forgot. I can't remember if it's miles or kilometers, but uh, either way, it was quite a, 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 a remarkable. And, and unprecedented kind of uh, kind kind of a thing. Well, yeah, I'm sure you've heard. Uh, you know, Colonel Harry Summers. Remember, you wrote the book on, uh, on on strategy about the Vietnam War, right? And and he says uh, he was at the Paris peace talks, and he's talking to a Vietnamese colonel, and he says, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Vietnamese colonel, you know, you you guys never defeated us on the battlefield, and the uh, Vietnamese colonel says that may be true, but it doesn't matter, yeah. you know. And so all this square mileage or square kilometer, whatever you're talking about, it's a it's a fantastic uh, achievement for the you know a little tiny country, basically a small country, and a, but doesn't matter. Uh, gobbling up a bunch of Russian uh, real estate, not necessarily going to win you a war. And uh, what's that, Bill Murray? movie you know meatballs or something it just doesn't matter it just doesn't matter and it's an interesting fact but it's not going to change the the outcome of the war and so uh these guys i mean hitler didn't even know italy right he has no idea what italy's capable of that's his supposedly closest ally you know his best buddy 
We're hanging the, hanging out together in Rome, hanging out together in Munich. We, we got the closest relationship of anybody, and he has no idea what that nation's capable of, right? He says, "Oh yeah, go down there and uh, you know you can you can whip up on uh, North Africa." Whoops, no, you can't. You can't. You, you can run the Mediterranean. Whoops, no, you can't. So these guys are just so ignorant of the wider world that once you get further than about a hundred miles from a Germany, German border, they are, they are just in the dark. Well, we know that this subject's a big subject. That's why we're going to devote at least a year to it. And I have a feeling a lot more time than that. Alex. Yeah. So one small question, which is, do you know what happened to the Estonian volunteer unit? I mean, I would guess that they're eventually folded into the 20th SS division that um, I think is constructed in like 43, 44. Yeah. That's an Estonian uh, division. Yeah. I, I do not know. I do not know. All right. Well, unless anybody has any other questions, uh, and I don't see anybody rushing to ask, uh, raise their hands, and I thank uh, Volker Bergen for joining us today. Um, thank you for raising those questions, Volker. Uh, I want to thank Rob for a, a really terrific discussion about this issue something uh, i i didn't know a damn thing about and um i'm sure all the rest of us didn't know much about either uh but thank you so much rob for doing this talk and the other talk on german wargaming another very thorough job you did and i want to thank you so much for uh participating uh rob is the author of many books on operation barbarossa both books on army group north center and south and i guess you synthesized it in one book for barbarossa and then you did that atlas of the eastern front and the atlas of the british krieg uh, period which is also a uh, really a valuable uh, source of information for everybody to look at so thank you so much you're welcome happy to happy to be here happy to participate happy to contribute thank you and uh, again the next talk will be with professor jeffrey roberts uh, and he will be talking about Stalin and June of 1941. Uh, thank you again, and thank you for everybody. Jim, what, what date? What date on that? So uh, that would be on October 28th at one o'clock East Coast time. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. See ya.